Recording is on. Greetings, everybody. It's another interview with Derek Jensen, which I'm sure you all already know, so we won't bother with introductions. Um, we'll just get right to it. So the, the last time, Derek, we spoke to you, um, we mentioned how we were collaborating um, with a group in, in the UK. And yeah, it's um, sad to report that it's kind of gone a bit cold. Um, what we were proposing, in, in just to refresh everybody's memory, is that we would do um, activism more like a PSYOP or alternative reality game. And I convinced them it was more appropriate for, for America. So we had this big project and did this project plan, and the idea was that they would go and do Insulate Britain and then consolidate um, with the rest of the groups in Britain and then start a more PSYOPs kind of thing in the States. But in the meantime, they went off and did Insulate Britain and they kind of got on this track with, um, you know, we can have a revolution within six months. Uh, um, they're thinking in terms of like Selma and civil rights and um, then I think the plan is they'll overthrow the government and then do citizens' assemblies, and citizens' assemblies will ask the scientists what to do, and they'll sort out climate change, and we'll live happily ever after. So it kind of went off into the weeds a bit. So, um, yeah, I, I think in the meantime, what we'll do is we will just, um, just wait for them to, you know, work out through their issues and just get closer to reality. Um, but yeah, do, does anybody else want to add anything to, to my coloring of the story? No, but I would like to tell Derek um, that I really like the podcast that you did with Dr. Peter Gray from the Isle of Man, which is a guy I had corresponded with um, two years ago when he started growing medicinal herbs. And I think that post podcast was a very was a very good quality. And it was extremely interesting. And um, both of you, thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was a really fun one to do. Yeah, it was brilliant. No, I have nothing to add to what Hugh had said. So, um, well, I'm sorry that happened. Do you, do you have a, a question in there? Yeah, and I just wanted to to update you on what, where we, what we're doing and the way we're thinking. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's um, yeah. The question really is, um, where do you think things are at with in terms of resistance and you know in terms of where things are at in America? Because the the vision that I had was things are getting hard harder. Um, things like the police crimes bill coming out in, in the UK are going to make traditional activism virtually impossible there. And, and so where, what do you think about where activism should go? I was thinking that, you know, Britain could be a safe base of operations for these people. And then you could, you know, um, do quite a lot remotely in the U S but, um, do you think things have to be on the ground like Thacker pass? Um, or, or can, can we do something more like a psyops? Um, I think that there's a, a bunch of things. There's, there are a bunch of things I'm thinking. One of them is that, um, and we've talked about this some before that I, I don't, I think Dunbar's number is something that we don't need to think about often enough and how you can't have really face-to-face -face participatory democratic decision-making decisions when you have, or decision-making processes when you have more than 120, 150 people. And in terms of 
and and I, I've I've said for many years, having read this in Mumford and agreed that one of the most important inventions of the dominant culture is the mega machine, which is an organized, a top-down bureaucratic military style organization that allows you to build pyramids or skyscrapers or a global economy or to invade Russia unsuccessfully or defend Russia. Um, and, um, and there are a bunch of reasons for that. One is I think that, that humans, I don't think we're evil. I don't think we're bad as such. I think that we are fundamentally contentious and we're going to get in spats and we're going to disagree with each other. And I'm sort of jumping all over because I think there's just so much to cover on this, this particular issue. Because another thing I'm thinking about is, yeah, he's really horrible, but Mike Tyson, the ex-boxer, his line about everybody has a plan until somebody gets punched in the face. And so we can have great plans, but humans are fundamentally contentious. And we're also, I, I don't mean this in as bad as it sounds, or maybe I do, that we can be really stupid sometimes. And I'm thinking of like postmodernism, which asks, you know, there's all these different, so often in so many ways, and we can go into this if you want, but this is just a side point. So often, if there's a possible way to interpret something in a stupid way, we're going to do it. And this contentiousness and interpreting things in stupid ways, one of my favorite examples of that is the homoousians and the homoousians. <coughs> Excuse me. They were sects of Christianity, I don't know, second or third cent century current era. So you get this dude who walks around preaching that we should love each other and preaching all this stuff. And then when two or three centuries, the homoousians and the homoousians were killing each other. One of them had an umlaut and one of them didn't. Were killing each other on the streets by the hundreds because one of them thought that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost was three in one. And the other thought that the Holy Ghost, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost were one in three. One being who was three, the other was three beings who were one. And they're killing each other over this crap. And... And, and and that's where we come back to, um, I mean, that's one reason the military can work, is you have all these different people with ideas, but at some point somebody gives somebody orders. And again, I'm not saying that's good for humanity. It, it, uh, there is a reason, though, that the Ottoman Empire lost every battle they fought from, like, I don't remember what year, 1650 to 1880 or something, which is they had their military style was not centrally coordinated. Well, they would get everybody to a battle and then everybody would fight on their own. And I know this gets me called a, a despot by anarchists, but I'm not suggesting I want to be in charge of any of this stuff. I'm just saying that there's there are reasons that... Uh, well, one more example, which is Rourke's Drift, where you had the British under centralized command had, I think, 100 people, and the Zulus had, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500, and they got absolutely massacred because they attacked one by one without any organized plan. So what's my point? My point is that one of the things I really liked about about your original plan was it sounded like there was some of it was going to be almost like a simulation you know the military does war games all the time and the reason they, oh just recently i just read this like last week that the british are reorganizing their commandos some i don't understand any of the details but the important thing is they did a war game somewhere in southern california with british commando or with u.s commandos and the british completely wiped out. They had to quit the war game halfway through because the British had wiped out the Americans with this new organizational system. And the point is that's that's the point of experience is that 
you know, you try something, it fails, and then, okay, well, that didn't work. And you need to figure out why it failed and fixed it, or you try something else. And that's just the, I mean, that's how we do with everything. That's how I write. You know, I try to write something and it doesn't work, so I go a different direction until finally you find something that, that might work. And I don't know, I'm just rambling. So interrupt me at any time and tell me to go a different direction. Well, no, I I agree with everything you're saying. So I I convinced um, you know, let's call him faulty. Um uh like Basil Faulty from Faulty Tales. Uh, um that's the code word we use for him. So um I convinced him that you know it, he has to be um a leader of a top organization. And he agreed, he was thinking along those lines too, saying that the left never works with this consensus and this um this holacracy they keep on telling themselves, but it's it's secretly centrally controlled. And so, you know, I, I encouraged them to say that, you know, it's a, it's a cult, you just face it, it's a cult. And uh, you're a cult leader, you're going to be, a, you, he's frequently been accused of being a doomsday cult leader, and so just, just embrace it, just say, <laughs> there's, there's nothing wrong with being a doomsday cult leader if we really are heading for environmental catastrophe. Um, so, yeah, so he, he completely bought into all of that. And yeah, from the anarchist point of view, I don't agree all all this flat organization because, um, you know, in like Spain in 1936, and they, in Barcelona, they, you know, they appointed Duruti as head of the, the armed forces. And he, you know, was a top-down organization because they knew the fascists would kill him if they didn't um, organize themselves in the hierarchy. So you have to put aside those kind of anarchist principles uh, for you know to to win out, so you can get back to sanity. But yeah, um, anyway, all of this was completely taken on board, um, I thought. But then um, this, you see, the idea that I had was that you have to build up the what we call the egregore, the mindset, and the. Um, you know, starting with the Dunbar's number and having Dunbar-like groups in a hierarchy, but you you need to start building the affinity group first and getting their thinking aligned and then go out and do an action. An action is easy after everybody's thinking is aligned, but they still think of it in the other way around, that you go out and do all these actions, you glue your face to the road, um, you go and block the traffic, and then you figure out what you're doing later. You know, you figure out the mindset later. So everybody's at cross purposes. They're all doing it for different reasons. They all have a different idea about whether it's solar panels and you know, or wind what? turbines, or whether it's um, it's saving the planet or saving the whale or doing this for our kids or saving civilization or making sure industrial civilization doesn't fall apart. So they're all completely at odds but all sitting there in the road, you know, <laughs> together. And I don't think it works. It has to be the other way around. You first have to figure out what, what everybody is doing. And then it's doing, you know, the action is easy after that, but you have to spend a long time building it up. Like the, the White Lotus um, Society in, in China is a very good example of, of you know. Well, I, I think I agree with you. And I think part of the problem is that I was just talking to somebody about this a couple of days ago that um, part of the problem is that a lot of us don't really know. Uh, environmentalists especially are uh, at cross purposes with themselves because for the most part, exactly what you said, they don't know. What do I want? Do I want, and I used to say this in my talks all the time. Do we want smaller clear cuts, kinder clear cuts, gentler clear cuts? Clear cuts are where you cut all the trees on a piece of land. Um, do we want... This is one reason why I have found it so important for myself to do this structural analysis or fundamental analysis of civilization to show that within civilization you can't have a 
sustainable society for functional reasons. And because it's so easy otherwise for everything to get co-opted as environmentalism has been into um, you know, perpetuating this culture instead. It's exactly what you said. What do we want? We want to save the planet. How do we want it? We want to do it by building a bunch of wind energy places that are going to destroy the wildlife where they live and or where they are. And so there is, you know, it, it's an interesting thing because on one hand, I think we do need to have the overall picture in mind. At the same time, when it comes to an individual struggle, you know, I don't think it's necessary for the people at Thacker Pass to be saying at Thacker Pass, we want to bring down civilization. We've been very careful about this in DGR, very not careful, but very straightforward that if you ask us, yeah, it all needs to come down. But at the same time, we can go to a place and um, no, we just want to save this particular prairie dog village. I mean, not saying we don't lie. But the point is, there are localized as well as larger scale objectives. And, and I think what's really important, and this is a place where a lot of the anarchists do fall down, is I think we, we always have to be trying, or somebody always has to be trying to think, how do we get from point A to point B? And what are the necessary intermediate steps? Um, so, for example, you asked how things are in the United States. I don't think um, – well, Wes Jackson said to me more than – probably 25 years ago uh, that the, the thing keeping the United States from rebelling was cheap diapers at Walmart. And his, his point was that you have cheap consumables from Walmart were what allowed people to maintain their faith in the system as their real wages were declining and had been declining at that point for 20 years. They've been declining for another 25 years now. And um, so are we at a point where enough people have I don't think that we're at a point where this where enough people recognize that the system really is killing the planet and and or their own circumstances are bad enough that they're willing to to give up on the system. They, they I, still I, have hope. So okay. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's that hope that's the poison. Either they either have yes, and they either have hope for um, the windmills will save the day, or they have hope that, well, if I can just win the lottery or get the right job, then my life will be fairly comfortable, and then who cares what happens after. Um, yeah, I think I think on the left in general, the the two things that really need to be sorted out. One is it, sort of kind of unquestioned assumptions that really need to be questioned now. And the first one is this idea that everything has to have consensus. So you have to have numbers and consensus, and it's all a numbers building exercise. And I think we have to admit that we we're never going to get the the numbers. Is you know people are going to be on the last vestige of the burning deck, um, and they're still not going to be. A, there's still not going to be a consensus, and not even a majority. I think at this stage we have to admit the, what the majority thinks uh, doesn't really matter because it shows that they're kind of delusional. They're in this kind of alcoholic rage, and and all these surveys are coming back now saying that 70% of people say they wouldn't do any more for you know, climate change or the environment than they're actually doing now. So the idea that we have to convince more people to drop this idea that, uh, you know, there'll be a general epiphany and everybody will start doing the right thing. I think we have to say, look, 
Uh, there's never going to be consensus. There's never going to be even a majority. A minority has to basically take um, take the necessary action um, against um, the laissez-faire majority. But yeah, there's there's only going to be a tiny number of active of of people that do the right thing um, that have to make the impact. And, and if they are a tiny number, there's only one thing they can do, and that's be accelerationist. The, the fundamental question of whether we're going to have, whether the majority of people will voluntarily walk away was, was why I wrote my book, Endgame. But I would do talks for years where I would ask the people, do you believe that this culture will undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living? And thousands of people at talks, I asked that, and nobody would say yes. Oh, one guy one time would raise his hand, and they looked around and he said, oh, voluntary, no, of course not. And the, the point is that we will have a transformation to a sane, sustainable way of living, or we, won't have a or we won't survive at all, by definition. But I literally asked that at just dozens of talks, and everybody would say, so no, we're not going to have a voluntary, voluntary transformation to a sane, sustainable, way of, sustainable way of living. And then my next question was, so if we don't believe we're going to have a voluntary transformation to a sane, sustainable way of living, what does that mean for our strategy and for our tactics? And nobody knew. And the reason that nobody knew is because we were all so busy pretending that we have hope that the system will undergo this voluntary transformation. And it's like you were saying about hope being the poison. And another part of the problem was, I mean, part of the reason I came to that analysis in the first place, apart from the fact that it's pretty straightforward and obvious when you look at it, is that when I was a baby activist, just working with all the more experienced activists, most of them, not all of them, but most of them were basically just hanging out by their fingernails, hoping that they could keep Selkirk Caribou or Kootenai Sturgeon alive until civilization collapsed. And they would never say this in public. There was a huge, huge gap in discourse between public and private. In private, they'd say, yeah, I know. I mean, there's the great line by David Brower, all, as an environmentalist, all of our victories are temporary and our losses are permanent. So you can stop them putting in the dam this year, and then you stop them next year, and you stop them next year, and then the next year after that, they do it. And so we all recognize that in private, but I didn't see anybody talking about it in the public. And so part of my job in life has been to, part of my work in life has been to try to bridge that gap between public and private discourse. Um, to which some people get really, really mad, and some people go, thank goodness, I've been thinking this myself forever, and I wish more people were talking about it. Um, but yeah, I think, and to go back to the original point, I think that in terms of activism, I think it really helps to think, to think, you know, maybe I just think this because I've read so much military history in my life, but they're very clear in any sort of reasonably competent military, okay, what, are, what is our goal one? And um, what is our overarching goal? You know, the North knew that the overarching goal was in the American Civil War was to make it so the South didn't, didn't secede, didn't win the war. Okay, how do you do that? Well, you blockade them, you cut down the Mississippi to cut them in two, you, and then, one of the reasons that Grant won at the end over Lee was because he recognized we've got essentially infinite number of men compared to them. So I can, I can attack, I can lose two to one casualties. And then instead of everybody else, what everybody else had done is say, I, you know, I got whipped in that battle. He'd say, fine, I'm going to attack you again tomorrow. And I'm just going to keep doing it and keep suffering two to one casualties because I know I can afford them. And you can't, I'm not saying that's a, a delightful strategy. What I'm saying is that ended up in that case being a winning strategy. And the important thing is not that the particular strategy, but the fact that he thought about it to think about what is the strategy we need. And so that's one of the things I think is hugely important is to figure out 
as best we can to think through what do we want? Okay, what are the intermediate goals that we need to do to get there? And then how do we accomplish each of those intermediate goals? Break it down as much as possible and and sort of move them forward one by one. It's it's I know it's bigger than this, but um, you know, a line that has made it so I can write my books is a line that my great grandmother always said to my mom, and my mom said to me, which is yard by yard, life's hard, inch by inch, life's a cinch. So you choose each of these goals and then we move we move toward them. Um but it involves conversations like this where we're trying to figure out, okay, what the hell do we want? And then how the hell are we going to get there? Well, I can tell you a very easy first goal that would be a stepping stone to, um, to bigger things. And it would accomplish a lot of goals. And that's, you know, in terms of aligning people's thinking and getting uh, at least a core group of people or at least getting people to come over to the idea of a sort of involuntary emergency deindustrialization, which I think is what our overall goal should be, because I don't think, um, I don't think industrial society is viable because it needs a perpetual growth and people have to come to terms with the fact that it, you know, one by one, that it can't be reformed. It's, you know, it's, it's not a cancer that can be benign. So what oh, I think a, a good intermediate goal is. Oh, somebody, I heard this ahead. great line the other day. Um, you can't throttle down a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, you can't taper a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. that's what I've I've often said. It. It's it's something that uh, that uh, Max Kaiser says, because they've been. It, it's a Ponzi scheme. I, I've I've done videos of trying to tell people that civilization is a Ponzi scheme. And I, nobody really believes me, I don't think. But it's, I mean, a number of people have pointed out that, yeah, it has to grow. It's, it's capitalist. I mean, nobody would invest in it unless they expected a bigger return. So it must, must grow. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, it, if, uh, if it ever stops, like with, you know, in the Soviet Union, if they stop the profit incentive, the whole thing <laughs> goes into reverse, just like a Ponzi scheme. So, yeah, it's... Um, it's a well-known phrase on, on Wall Street saying you can't taper a Ponzi scheme. And the stock market is a Ponzi scheme. Right. But um, I think the way to, to go to ferret, to ferret out people who are at least that can be reached um, is, is to frame it in terms of um, geoengineering. I think that there's a very good wedge issue that will make people make up their minds about civilization. They're not being challenged really to make their, make up their minds about the viability of civilization, industrial civilization. And I think that the way to do way to force the issue is to keep harping on about geoengineering because geoengineering is coming. They, they're stalking the very powerful players like Bill Gates and billionaires behind, behind it. So it's a, a wedge issue that makes people think, you know, are they tree huggers or are they, you know, Elon Musk rocket cultists and, and decide. And I think if we do that, then, then we win because most people are sane enough not to embrace geoengineering. It's, it's a vocal minority that are prepared to do it. And they prepare to do it unilaterally too. I, I could well imagine individuals like Bill Gates going ahead. But there are guys that are complete psychopaths like, you know, David Keith and Ken Caldera from um, this Harvard grad that have been pushing geoengineering for 20 years. The really dangerous one is solar radiation management. And the next big contender is marine cloud, cloud brightening. But they're all various lunatic ideas. And the, the sheer lunacy of them kind of sobers people up. Sobers the average redeemable person. So it separates people into the, you know, the sheep and the goats because some people are just irre irredeemable. They just think that we're going to get to the singularity of the nerds and AI is going to solve all our problems and we're going to have prosperity. What well, That's what Elon Musk says. So AI is going to give us prosperity. Um, but it's obviously not. <laughs> it's going to do the opposite. But I... Uh, 
Yeah, I think that's the issue that sub subs people up because it's it's one step too far. Everybody will accept civilization because it seems kind of benign. But when you take it to its logical conclusion that we control everything down to the weather, I think most people say, okay, that's too far. And then they're ready to turn back. May, may so I, it, may it's I... just a question of trumping up the geoengineering issue. Yeah, go ahead, Sophie. No, I was just um, reading on the comments uh, that Bob had asked a question uh, saying, why do you think people would object to geoengineering? All the normies I've spoken to think it's a great idea. It's just like volcanoes do. <laughs> so why do you think, yeah, why do you think people will, <laughs> will object? Uh, be, because the if you the best thing to do is to read uh, a book called uh, the big bad fix um, which goes into it very very carefully but the major thing is that the the guy's motives are not very pure so david keith and bill gates for example they all saying oh we mustn't patent this this is all for the good of the tech it's it's just in our back pockets and it's an insurance policy but they also are on record saying that they have the patents and they will, you know, um, whoever whoever owns the technology for geoengineering, once the public gets over its fear of it, will will make money like will be the you know make money like bandits. So they're saying it's it's a huge gold mine in technology. So in the one they they pure capitalists trying to profit. And then, uh, you know, on the other side, then they're pushing this idea that it's just an insurance policy in case we don't meet the targets, we want to have a plan B. And they all know it's plan A. Um, the other thing is, so it's it's really the, the answer is that it's a question of educating people about what geoengineering is. The other thing is, it's a military technology. It's always been a military technology. And it's always been plan A. So if you go back to the very first report that was given to LBJ about climate change in 1965 they said that the they gave him a secret uh, report on you know the dangers of climate change and they had only you know due to co2 emissions and they had only one suggestion not cutting industrialism not greening industrialism not um, you know cutting emissions it was just one thing. They said, we have to do geoengineering. And they went ahead and did it in the military. It's, you know, it was used in Vietnam. And they said it was, you know, kind of mixed bag and stuff, but not, not really. They, they thought it was a success. So the re I would go as far as to say, I don't have any evidence for it, but I'd go as far as to saying the reason why they're so complacent about, you know, at COP26 and in, in the IPCC in general is, they they all intend to do geoengineering. They intend they don't intend to cut back in the sliders. So plan A is geoengineering. They are just warming the public up for it. So it's, it's again it's a psyop. It's a, it's about info war on on who who colors geoengineering in which way. And I think we can do a hell of a lot better. Um, you know uh, because uh, on our side they call us the tree huggers. I think we can do better than the transhumanist call of that the rocketeer side um because uh really we have heart and people are scared and people are scared to 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 go down that route so it's you know the, the guys are psychopaths that that want to do this and so i don't think people will trust them so you know when people get scared it's like do we turn back or do we follow the psychopaths and i think they will turn back so that so that's why i think this is a battle we could win if we shape it around geoengineering. That requires a bigger propaganda campaign than the billionaires. Um, I mean, I, I agree. Um, but I almost feel like what um, you were referring to about the Ponzi scheme and things like that, when the monetary system gives up the ghost and hyperinflation and those kind of things that bring collapse to people's house you know at an individual level price rises things like that they are probably easier to 
make people lose faith in the system than going down this abstract route of trying to explain people. I mean, people already understand about climate change to a degree, but it's like the weather out the door, you know, it changes. And how are they going to get on board with the idea that, you know, as you were saying, like cloud seeding, and especially you, you said yourself, there's going to be a massive propaganda campaign to legitimize this and to make it, um, you know, to sell it. So you'd have to, yeah, we'd have to do well, some drastic um, spoiler on, <laughs> on all of these psychos that want to do that. Yeah, so, yeah, at this point it gets pretty dark, but I might as well come out with it since you went there. Um, what they show as a track record of getting mass consensus and a big change against the public's interest is they, they developed shock and awe. So they've used this tactic of shock and awe. So we're, it's pretty obvious that we're heading into stagflation and financial collapse. So they, they are very likely to, to use a crisis to force geoengineering. So in other words, if, uh, if we go to war with China or there's Cold War II and a proxy war with Iran or all these kind of things you can imagine, those become uh, the vehicle that they, they can, you know, while the, the, the public is in complete shock, um, that's how they can ride in with these things. So, you know, the very first wet bulb event that kills off people in Pakistan, that's the excuse they'll use. So it's, it, they'll use a terror tactic. So we only have a limited amount of time to, to run before it's completely out of our control, before resisting it will be something close to treason during war. What do you think, Derek, about this uh, pl the place of geoengineering in, in the tactics that we're talking about? Well, I, I agree that it has always been plan A, and I would say it has always been plan A since the culture emerged because uh, we are, I mean, it's there in the story of Noah, you know, we are God and we are Noah, we're going to, we're going to wipe out the planet and we're going to save what we feel like and we're going to uh play god that's what that's what this culture has been about from the beginning so absolutely geoengineering will happen and will they they will push it and uh the concern i have was the concern i don't know his name but it was talking dance macabre macabre however you say it yeah tom Tom, that Tom was saying about, I mean, here's, here's part of the problem. I hate to be so cynical all the time, but if you pump a ton of money into propaganda and you really push it, you can convince a lot of people that up is down and you can convince them of almost anything. And I, um, and I don't think, I mean, they have been pushing this, the geoengineering, but they can just push it more and more. And we will say, you know, we will all chant war is peace, ignorance is strength and geoengineering is salvation. And I don't think it will merely be a top down yeah, the propaganda is going to be a lot top down. But then there's another part, too, which is that um, my friend George Draffen used to say all the time, you don't need a conspiracy when everybody thinks the same. And this notion that the earth was put here for us to control is really pushed all through the, the culture. The the um, just that that's actually the conversation that I need to have in that that's why I need to go a little is, is that we're having a sort of emergency conversation with some people about um, whether wild nature needs to be managed and there are even people within within DGR the organization I co-founded who have been arguing that nature needs to be managed 
And that, of course, is something I completely disagree with. And sure, there, there are individual cases where you can manage nature, like if you live in a place that has a lot of fires, you might, you know, have a defensible space around your house. Or if you want to have a little garden, you need to manage your garden. Otherwise, it's not a garden. It's just a wild space. But um, I love the line by David Ehrenfeld about how just because we can commit minor miracles, we think we can commit major miracles. And what he meant by that is that just because we think we can do surgery, which is a minor miracle, or just because we can, we have antibiotics, or just because we can have a computer, all these, or have a car, have an airplane, minor miracles, that means we think we can manage the whole planet, which would be a major miracle, which we can't do. And my point is that this managerial ethos is so, and the, the, the notion that when I was writing Myth of Human Supremacy, I was looking around and there are so many people who say explicitly that humans are the only ones who create meaning and that all human creations are, I don't remember the word, but all human creations are basically volitional and anything, any meaning that we ascribe to the natural world is a mere coincidence that we're projecting onto it. And great examples of this are, um, you know, when people think about the most important inventions of all time, we think about, you know, the lever, the screw, gunpowder, you know, the wheel. Um, but we don't think about proprioception. We don't think about m metabolism. We don't think about sex. We don't think about all these things that nature invented. And the only things that count are the ones we did. And it, the re, I'll take it back to geoengineering now that the only thing that's going to matter is what we do. This is, by the way, is the myth, is the story of Frankenstein. And I don't really want to get into this, but a lot of this has to do, honestly, with a patriarchal womb envy. Uh, the planet can create life. That's why scientists get so excited when they create enzymes in a laboratory. It's like, oh my God, we created life. Yeah, bunnies do it every day. Grow up. Um, but if we make it, it's something important. But if, you know, if nature sequesters carbon, who cares? But if I did it, if I, Bill Gates did it, or Elon Musk, or me, Derek Jensen, if I figured out an engineering way, well, that would be special. And my point, that's really off the point. The real point, all I wanted to say, and I should have shut up, is that we will see a huge propaganda campaign, which I think a significant portion of people will fall for. I could be wrong, and I'd be glad if you could convince me that, no, it's not going to, the people will at long last stand up and say, this is, this is, to go cliche, this is a bridge too far. I'm not sure. No, I agree. I agree with you. I agree with you, but... I uh, go back to what I said, we need to get over this idea that consensus matters. So to me, uh, it, it would be good that they do that because what it means is they would surface and radicalize the tiny right. 500 or so <laughs> that are gonna make the difference. You see, right. if you have 500 radicals that are extreme, they, um, they have the power to bring down the entire rotten house of cards. Yeah, I don't so, disagree. And so we want the 500. And the more there is consensus, the more that it radicalizes and alarms <laughs> the chosen 500. Well, I think, and yes, I'm, I'm going to, I agree with you. And I'm going to disagree with what I just said now, too, though which is the good thing about a lie from the perspective of somebody who doesn't want to believe it is that lies are incredibly expensive to maintain and they have to say the lie again and again a thousand times, but you only really need to hear the truth, you know, 10, 15 times. And for at least some people that can really break through. I know a, a great example of this is, you know, I, 
I cared about nature and everything else in my 20s. I was at this library and the book, The Natural Alien, fell off the shelves into my hands. And it was the first book I ever read that did not take for granted the perspective that the world was created for humans, but instead it was... There was a great line in there that, that he was quoting David Ehrenfeld. He said, what do you do if you make some impassioned defense of some creature and at the end of it, the person you're making this impassioned defense of, defense to, says, uh, well, what good is it? He said, well, the only response, not to be insulting, but the only response really is to say, well, what good are you? Um, to show that when you apply this, it's like when people say, oh, we can make, we can make a sacrifice zone. We'll kill all the plants and animals over here to turn this into a field, and then we can have lots of food and it'll be great. It's like, okay, let's make it your family. How about if I just kill you, two of your brothers and your sister, and don't kill your other two siblings? Those will be the sacrifice zone, but it'll be best for everybody. They're like, hey, I don't like that. Well, yeah, well, they don't like it either. So my point is, I read that. That was all it took, and I've been off to the races ever since. So I, I, I agree with you. And it, it doesn't take much, and, but we need to, to use this in a value-neutral sense. We need to be propagandizing this as much as we can now, obviously, which is why, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm telling Grandma how to suck eggs here because, you know, this is what you've been doing for a long time. Yeah, the, the idea is if you think <laughs> of... Um, more of the cultish aspects. The, the early Christian church, I mean, the Christian church is St. Paul's cult, and the, the early ch Christian church benefited <clears throat> from being persecuted. The Romans never realized that they were actually assisting the growth of the Christian church by, by persecuting it. So I think in some ways, uh, Fawlty has the right idea that um, you know, you need uh, stalwarts that are really dedicated. And then the, the moral um, example is what recruits other people to do the same radical kind of self-sacrifice. <clears throat> but um, so he's right in a way. I think where, where it's wrong is, <clears throat> is the end goal is something which is, you know, uh, to do with the government, that the government comes in to, you know, rescue us or we pressure the government into taking action. And, or we remove the government and say like, well, forget about the government. <laughs> we, we just need an emergency, you know, an involuntary emergency deindustrialization. And so we don't need the government for that. So the, the idea is uh, then you, you don't be above ground and try and make a big hoopla means you'd be underground and recruit like you the early Christian church. So you you want martyrs <laughs> for the cause rather than um, you know martyrs for some political revolution that turns into citizens' assemblies or something. I'm sorry to I'm sorry to bulge in there, but I got a note saying that uh, Derek, you have to leave at a certain time and I just wanted to check where how long do we have left or is it soon that you have to Go to yeah, your next appointment. It's twelve fifty-two here, and I I need to be I need to leave within a minute. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. Well, then we better round it off. But um, well, what do you think? Yeah, do you would you want to have the the last word and just just try and round all of this up? Well, for me, for us, Derek? For me, everything comes down to um, making the health of the planet first. And once you do it, once, once that's the difficult step, or it's the easy step too, but that's the important step. And once you do that, then everything else becomes technical. It becomes a question of, um, you know, all of my work, all of my work, all my 20 some books can be summed up by saying, um, this way of living will not last. And when it's over, I would rather that there's more of the world left rather than less. And then once you decide that, Everything else becomes technical. Okay, do we organize above ground or below ground? Do we do, we do this? Do we do that? Um, how do we organize? 
those questions all become technical <clears throat> once you uh, once you make your loyalty to the to the to the real world. That's the key for me is trying to help people remember that that's where their loyalty needs to be. And then after that, yeah, let's talk tactics and strategy. Okay, well, I've enjoyed yeah, this. Yeah, I'm into that. I would, I would love to. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks so much, sir. Take care. Bye. Bye. I'll just stop the recording, guys, a second.